Has anyone else had ant issues in their plane? <laughs> what, they got in the right wing? The things you never even knew could be a problem in plane ownership. <laughs> so We're Aaron and Paul, a couple of pilots driven by the unique adventures that an airplane can take you on. And we recently finished building our beautiful Bearhawk 5, affectionately named Tina. Clear prop. We're headed south from Toledo, Ohio to visit Hartzell Propeller, where we're about to learn some things about our prop that really surprised us. We came into this expecting to learn about the build process, but ultimately left with skills and knowledge that could save us tens of thousands of dollars in the future. Well guys, Aaron and I are pretty excited right now. We are going to Hartzell Propeller, their actual factory in Piqua. Ohio, if I say that right, it could be Pequa, I don't know. Over the past eight months, Aaron and I have been building this plane, and one of the big decisions we had to make along the way was what propeller to put on the front of this. And we did not realize, getting into all the plane building goodness, how much of a decision the propeller really is. It has a huge impact on how fast you climb, your cruise. It has impact on how smooth your flight is and uh, the vibrations in the plane itself. We ended up going with the Hartzell Free Blade Trailblazer propeller. It's a fully composite propeller that was made for backcountry experimental aviation, just like what we're in right now. And it has been a beast in the short time that we've been flying Tina. While we were up here in Toledo, we're like, oh, Hartzell's pretty close. They've been very kind to welcome us into their factory, and we get to see how these propellers are made. We are excited to bring you guys with us to get the answers to those questions that Aaron and I had about our propeller straight from them and hopefully could inform your decisions along the way if you're putting a prop on your plane. We're headed to there now and dodging some weather. Yeah, this Midwest is definitely put it, putting us through the ringer. On the way out here to Ohio, there were pop-up storms. And on the way down to Pequa now, there's a bunch of storms that are kind of popped up. We knew there were going to be some, but uh, they have definitely revealed themselves a bit more this morning than we were anticipating. We're going to be picking through a little bit to get there, um, but we're cruising along. Right now, it looks like we should be 30 minutes out. I like flying lower. It's way prettier. It is prettier. Piqua traffic, November 513, Echo Pop, uh, final 26, Piqua. No way, we made it to Hartzell Field. Well, hey guys. <laughs> How you doing? Dude, it's so good. Midwest so weather's fun. <laughs> oh, this is, we have some rain and Oh, so, this is good, so right after we landed, Beth and Alex took us around to all of Hartzell's different facilities here in Piqua. They have one building just for the carbon fiber propellers, like right where they, they build all the carbon fiber. Then they have another test facility, which actually has this little skunk works uh, logo on the outside. But that's where they test everything. They'll do like bird strike testing. They have their, their wind tunnel tests over there. So full facility just for testing these propellers uh, to get them to certified standards. And then they have this main facility that we're at right now where the manufacturing of all the metal parts happens, final assembly happens, we're shipping out to all of us happens. And then they also are building or refurbishing a brand new building just on the backside of Hartzell. And it is massive. That's where all of the carbon fiber work is going to be moving into. That's where their service center is gonna be, Whirlwind Propeller is gonna be in there. So that is just gonna be a huge hub that hasn't opened quite yet. It's just underway and they're building it out slowly but surely, but in the next year, that'll be fully open. Now we're at their main headquarters. This is where their offices are and everything like that, but they're gonna take us in and take us on a full tour in here. So let's go. Good, sir. This is a wall. <laughs> On the way in, they have a tie back to the history of Hartzell in this beautiful hallway. This is actually the first version of composites that Hartzell tampered with in the 40s. They called it Hartzite, and it was to mimic wood because everything else was wood back in the day. Definitely the leader in composite technology, but very different than composites as we know them today. Really? So what is that material like most similar to today? It's like a plastic of some sort, yeah, pretty much. So when we talk about composites, all that really means is something that's made of multiple materials. 
and Hartzell's been exploring different types of composite blades since the 40s. Now, in 2025, they are one of the industry leaders in carbon fiber blades, and one big decision we had to make at the beginning of our build was the material of the prop we wanted. Coming into this build, honestly, we didn't know why we would want one material over another, or ultimately what would make someone pick something like aluminum over carbon. What makes someone want to buy an aluminum one versus carbon fiber? Main reason? Yeah. Cost. Cost. That's it. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, we have some specific applications where they want the weight on the nose. They don't want to lose and have the lighter, but a lot, I would say 95% is the cost. We also have customers who I think are still maybe a little bit scared because, yeah, they still fear that it's not robust and it. Yeah. They don't trust it's that it. preconceived notion. So. Absolutely. To me, if I could afford it, I'd go this way. Oh, I would absolutely. I've and seen all of them that it what it's been through, and it right. sure holds up way better than the aluminum. And the edges are definitely stronger than the aluminum is. These get beat up. Some of the ag guys, they'll have repairs, just big loops in it. <laughs> you know, if you're picking up rocks, hitting in reverse, trying to load up, go again. I was out in Boise. We had guys hitting wires, hitting trees. And they just file it off. Wow. Carry on. After learning about all the different materials that make these props, Rolf, Alex, and Beth took us through these double doors to show us inside the factory and give us a true inside look at how everything is really made. Now, we weren't allowed to take cameras in there to protect the specifics of the process, but here's my detailed drawing for future propeller makers to replicate. That was so freaking cool. This factory that Hartzell has in the back is massive. The building that you see on the outside is just like a tiny glimpse of all the machinery and all the stations that they have there. What's interesting to me about that is we've been to other factories before where everyone kind of gets hands-on in a bunch of different processes. From talking to Rolf, it seems like everyone has their station and expertise. And so it's really cool that like there is this kind of a Assembly, and so it gets products being made on maybe a faster pace than if everyone was involved in a little bit of everything else. <laughs> I thought I could take this chance to actually walk you through our trailblazer process from start to finish. And there's a lot that goes on, so I think I have to break this into different steps. There is the actual machining of the hard metal parts. Then there is the creation of the carbon fiber propeller blades and then there's final assembly. So a lot of the actual machining of like our prop hub or our, um, what's the thing called that the prop goes into? Shank. The, uh -huh. <laughs> so the machining of the aluminum shank on our trailblazer propeller and the spinner and the spinner hub, everything gets done here in this part of the factory. So anything metal gets taken care of here. All the composites are created at their composites factory, which is a different building that we drove by earlier. So that's actually the formation of the propeller itself. Once that's formed, it comes over here. So now we have the aluminum products, we have the composite products, and those all come together for final assembly, where everything is actually assembled together and then packaged up and shipped out. Okay, seeing this process was fascinating and truly it's changed my understanding of how these blades are made and ultimately how durable they are in the long term. But there were several questions along the way that I wanted to get answers to. And one question I always had was, what is at the core of this blade? I've heard that it was a foam core and in my mind, I'm thinking like styrofoam or something like that. I love that you have these cutouts here. Yeah. yeah it's really good. So it's, it's cool to display the differences because I mean, it's the exact same station, the exact same blade for the same exact propeller. Fundamentally different airfoils too. Mm -hmm. Entirely different airfoils. Yeah, the carbon fiber is up to 10 times stronger than the wood counterparts in the competition. Mm. Um, so we can have much thinner airfoils. For a long time, we were calling our composites foam core composite. Yeah, I've heard that. So do me a favor and take your fingernail and try to poke that foam. <laughs> I was actually thinking that when you handed it to me. This doesn't feel like foam. Not at all. We need to come up with a new term for it. So if you have any suggestions, please let us know. <laughs> yeah, but really. It's a synthetic material and it's expanded foam technically, but it's very, very, very dense. And again, because the structure of our blade is the carbon fiber aspect, we could, if we wanted to, pull that whole foam, foam core out and the prop would be just as strong. 
Mm. Wow. So it offers nothing to the structural integrity, but we leave it in because A, it helps us form the shape and it wouldn't be an easy process to remove it, but it also helps with some vibration dampening as well. Yeah, I can see that. So after we wrapped up the factory tour, we headed out to the Hartzell hangar where they had set up a display to help us answer a few more key questions we had when deciding on this prop. And one big question was how the carbon is ultimately attached to the shank. You know, there have been a couple crazy stories I've heard about natural core composite blades actually departing the aircraft by separating from the shank at the lag screws mid-flight. There's actually an AD about this. And it made me curious about how this Hartzell was ultimately attached to the hub. Like, how do you attach carbon fiber effectively to aluminum? It's just the design of the internal part of the shank. As we put the carbon fiber material on, it goes on dry around the core to get its shape. And then as soon as we impregnate it with the epoxy resin uh, down here in the shank, that fills up and it basically expands that area and completes a, a 360 degree wedge formally forever locking that shank to that blade. So you won't have things where like the the propeller just won't come off the shank. Like it it is it is a part of the shank. It Correct. is integrated in. So there's no point of failure there, which is that's confidence boost. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, I've seen these things, like, how does it stay on? <laughs> like, yep. That's really interesting. One thing that ultimately stood out throughout this tour was how repairable the carbon fiber is versus the aluminum. The only way to repair an aluminum blade is to take material away. So if you have nicks in the leading edge, um, essentially the only thing you can do is file it smooth. And eventually you're going to file it or grind it so many times that you're below what we call our minimum dimension. That's the, that's the minimum dimension that that blade's allowed to have and still be considered airworthy. Once an aluminum blade drops below that, uh, we can't save it. Um, we, we, we send it to recycle because we can't add material to an aluminum blade. Carbon fiber blades, we can add material. They, they truly are a lifetime blade. There's a few things that you can do to them that makes it un unsavable. Mm -hmm. um, if you happen to breach it down to the down to the core, we generally can't save it. If you have a prop strike bad enough that it- I love how you said generally can't save it. Yeah, like, generally can't save it. <laughs> if you lost just the tip of this blade, we, yeah. we could save the blade. It, wow. it would be a factory only repair. You'd send it back to us. We'd put it back in the factory mold, put the tip back on, repaint it, put it back in the propeller. That's so impressive. No way. So there's, there's a very limited number of things you can do to one of these propellers that we can't fix. We're just chilling out here in the hangar. We're like learning more and more and things are just coming up. And Opie was just over here pointing at this tip of our blade right here. And he was like, yeah, you could lose this tip of your blade up to a quarter inch of this and you can still fly it. It's still airworthy. And not only can Hartzell fix nearly anything on this blade, they even let owners do field repairs on them. So earlier in the day, Beth, Rolf, and Alex took us into their training room where they showed us the field repair kit that Hartzell sells. This kit has everything in it needed to repair and paint a carbon fiber blade with damage on it, along with instructional videos on how to do it. So for less than $800, you can repair the blade yourself instead of having to send it to a service station. They actually today set up the whole process from start to finish how the repair goes and they have these five TBM blades to actually show the process so they each have the same nicks on them and then we get to step through the entire repair so I made I made these last year to basically show repair progression these are the three most common types of uh, damage it's a crushed trail uh, crushed trailing edge a gouge and a, a debonded erosion shield all the damage that's on this blade is completely airworthy you could fly it as is just like this, which is great if you're in the back country, but if you, if you, you know, if you're in the hangar and your brand new TBM, you know, has this, has this gouge on it, you want to fix it. So we, we allow for a field repair. So that's what this, this shows the beginning of the field repair. In this case, the debonded area is uh, sanded away. What you see underneath is the edge of the erosion shield, and this is erosion mesh. The only reason that erosion mesh is there is for um, rock chips. Um, it takes rocks and deflects them off the blade. You're allowed to have it missing. So in the case of this gouge, you have to sand part of it away in order to repair the carbon fiber underneath. All of our damage limits apply only to the carbon fiber portion of the blade because that's the structure. So you're allowed to have a miss missing portion of this mesh. There's different repair areas. So you have to go to the repair manual and map your repair areas to know what damage is allowed in what area of the blade. This is the only portion of the blade that there is fiberglass on. 
Uh, sometimes when we, when you have a debond, this material might get um, a little bit of a pucker. It might get stretched just a little bit. If you want to make that smooth transition so that when you paint it, it disappears, uh, we just use this small piece of fiberglass material to make that transition. Hmm. Once it's sanded off, you can't feel it. And then once it's painted, you can't see it. Is this one an example of something that was actually like chipped or something wrong that was fixed? Or is this just like a... That's a repair blade. That is a repair blade. That's amazing. I really thought you would have seen some sort of like... I don't know, a little difference, whether it's in the paint or whether it's in like the texture, but you really can't tell. I think what amazes me the most is Hartzell not only creates an incredible blade, but they want us to be able to use this for the lifetime of the aircraft. They want us to be able to use this continually, and they've given us now a resource that we can make these repairs. I feel like it's something that I don't want to have to do, but it is something that we could, <laughs> could do, do if we needed to. Let's hope that day doesn't come, but if that day does come, I do feel like it's something we'd be able to yeah, manage. Yeah, and we know who to call. We'll just call Opie. We'll yeah, like, oh. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Happy to help. Pick <laughs> wire traffic, November 513, Echo Papa, departing 26. That was so fun. An entirely another thing to actually see how it's made and uh, just find so much confidence in the prop that we're flying right now. Even if you get like a freaking like scratch or nick on it, it is repairable. It's wild that we can repair it. Piqua. Piqua? Piqua. Piqua. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs>